and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Dear friends and neighbors, we should anticipate other events of this nature to occur. Let us be mindful of all of those families who were victims of the mass murder in our prayers. Yeah. Nevertheless, I come to you tonight to talk about Jesus. You see, it's in events like this that happened in Newtown, Connecticut, that we still need to make known to our society of Jesus. Because Jesus said he was the way, and he promised that he would go with us always, even to the end of the world. So we must lift up Jesus. And from the verse tonight, I want to go to John, the 12th chapter, and the verse is number 32. And these are the words that Jesus said. He said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So it's imperative that we lift up Jesus so that the world in darkness can see Jesus and come to him before it is everlasting and eternally too late. You see, people need to hear about Jesus. And that means that we need to talk about Jesus. See, let me show you what happens uh, when people talk about Jesus. If you will, the book is Mark, the fifth chapter. I'm beginning with about verse number 25. You can see that Jesus, as he was going about doing his daily work, the Bible says there came to him a woman. And this woman had an affirmity. She had been suffering from a blood issue, and she had suffered some 12 years as a result of that. This woman, she at some point in time was affluent because she was able to go and spend money to the doctors and the soothsayers and the uh, witch doctors and the quacks and all of those folk trying to put herself in a good state of health. But the Bible says she didn't get any better, but that she grew worse. Now, I, I want to specifically pick, point out this verse to you, and I, I will get back to uh, the, uh, the statement that I was making here, but I want you to see here, the Bible says in verse number 27, when she had heard of Jesus. Now, the point is, we have to lift up Jesus. My subject tonight is lifting up Jesus, and he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So now what had happened in the course of this lady's life, after spending all her money and she didn't get better, she was no doubt sitting around chatting with some of her friends, and they said perhaps to her, well, have you heard about Jesus? And so in that conversation, no doubt they talked about all the things that Jesus had done, all the good works that he had wrought for all the people. And so then the, the idea came to her in her mind, no doubt she said, well, if I can just get close enough to him, if I can get close enough just to touch the hem of his garment, I, I believe I would be healed. So the Bible says that that's exactly what she did. So she came amongst the press on this particular day, and Jesus was walking by. The Bible says she got close enough to touch his garment. Yeah, she touched his garment, and immediately she was healed. But what I want you also to understand is that when she touched his garment, Jesus immediately stopped dead in his tracks. He turned around and said, who touched me? His apostles, they were somewhat incensed. And they came and said, my Lord, with all these people thronging around you, anybody could have touched you. Jesus said, somebody touched me. Now the point I'm trying to get you to understand, this woman was unknown to Jesus before this time, but he made it very clear that somebody touched him. So in the eyes of Jesus, we are somebody. And we need to understand, the apostles were trying to make it clear, anybody, 
out of everybody could have touched you. But Jesus said it was somebody out of everybody, not just anybody, but somebody touched me. And so then we find that in the process, Jesus looked around, and this woman, then she realized that uh, she couldn't keep herself from Jesus, and she said, immediately, uh, I touched you. The Lord said, and this is what he said in verse number 30, Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him. So when the woman touched his garment, there was a miraculous portion that went out of Jesus into this woman, and he knew that something had happened. He knew that somebody had touched him for a particular reason. That was a touch of faith because the woman said, if I could just touch his garment, then I know I will be made whole. So then as we continue here, this is what the Bible says. Uh, and he looked around about to see her that had done this. But the woman, fearing, trembling, knowing what was done, she came down and fell down before him and told him all that had happened. No doubt she told him, my Lord, I spent all the money. Lord, I, I, I've become impoverished. I'm in the poor house now because I spent all of my money with these doctors and these quacks and I didn't get any better. But somebody told me about you, Lord, and I just wanted to touch your garment. And Jesus said to her, go in peace. He said, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now the point I'm trying to get you to understand is if we talk about Jesus, just as they had talked about Jesus back then, this woman had the opportunity to hear about Jesus. Remember, he said, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So what's happening today? We're just not lifting up Jesus like we ought to. No doubt if uh, all the preachers, all the deacons, all the elders, if they were involved with lifting up Jesus, then we would see a change in our communities, a change in our congregation. But we have to all get busy. We've got to be on the same page. We have to lift up Jesus. And all the programs that the church is espousing, leadership has to be together so we can collectively lift up Jesus. And then we will see a great difference. We see, when we talk about Jesus, we talk about his promises. Jesus said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare this place for you, I'm going to come again. That where I am, there you may be also. So you need to understand that Jesus has done some things for us. He's doing them for us on a daily basis. We just need to wake up, open our eyes, smell the coffee, and know that Jesus is there. He said, he promised, he said, I will go with you always, even to the end of the world. Nobody else can do that. Nobody else can make a promise like that and keep it. Yeah, people can make the promises, but nobody else can make a promise like that and keep it. Remember now, Jesus had told his apostles that he was going to go into Jerusalem and he was going to be crucified and, and that he would be buried and that he would raise again on the third day. And yes, we know the story. Jesus went from judgment hall to judgment hall before Pilate, then Herod, then back to Pilate. Then we need to understand that Jesus then suffered a cruel, ignominious death on the cross of Calvary. You see, I came talking about Jesus so that you can hear about Jesus. Perhaps there may be somebody tonight, God forbid, who has not heard about Jesus. Nevertheless, we have a great deal of work to do to spread it abroad that Jesus has come. And then the best part about it is that Jesus is coming again. So we need to understand and recognize that the best part of our lives haven't happened yet. The best is yet to come. We know what happened when he came the first time. He did good. He healed the sick and the lame and the blind. He raised the dead. He did all of those wonderful and magnificent things. But when he comes back this time, he's going to take all of us who have accepted him, who have heard his word and believed who repented of our sins and confessed, who were born again in the liquid grave of baptism for the remission of our sins, who have lived a faithful life. Now we can hear Jesus say, come on up here. I'm going to make you rule over a few things here. You've been ruled over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many up here with my father. We have a lot of work to do. 
In Acts, the fourth chapter, we can see that many which heard the word believed. There are about 5,000 folk on one occasion who heard and believed and were baptized. We have to get busy. We have to tell the people the good news of Jesus. And so we are weeping tonight with the people of Newtown, Connecticut. And we just have to understand that they are experiencing a, a great a burden of uh, pain and grief because these children, before they actually had a chance to, to have a real beginning in life, they were just beginning to read and to write and to learn those things. And then Satan let it be known that he doesn't have any respect to persons. That's what Satan's saying. I'll kill your babies. I'll kill your mama. I'll kill your daddy. It doesn't matter. I will bring havoc on all the folk here in this land. I want you to understand now, even though we experience this atrocity here in these modern days and time, do you remember what Pharaoh did when uh, Moses was born? The Pharaoh ordered that all of the babies, all the males would be killed. All right, that's what Pharaoh did. So there was a great deal of, of, of this kind of atrocity happening in the past. And if that wasn't enough, you remember Herod? When, when Herod had sent forth the, uh, the wise men, and they didn't come back to him like he thought, he realized that he had been played. And so then he was angry. And then he sent out a decree to kill all the babies. All right? So see, Solomon said there's no new thing under the sun. Right. So we need to keep in mind that, as the Bible says, that evil men and seducers, they're going to wax Worse and worse. So we, we can expect to see something else happen. Uh, I think we've already seen them go into a church and, and shoot it up. All right? They've gone into schools and killed the baby. They've gone into the institutions of higher learning. Satan will go everywhere. That's why it's important that you be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus because he said, I'll go with you always, even to the end of the world. And if something should happen, should you become a victim of collateral damage, you need to recognize that Jesus is right there and he will take you on home with him. All you have to do is put your faith and trust in him. Just understand that Jesus, yes, represents the great God Almighty, uh, the greatest being ever. If you listen to David over in the book of Psalms and uh, Psalms, the uh, 14th division, in verse number one, you can hear uh, Sol uh, so uh, David as he says, uh, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt that have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. That's to what uh, 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 the devil has said. There's no God. But we know that God is. We can look about in the morning when we wake up. When we see the daylight, the sunshine. When we look out and see the trees and we hear the birds singing and the flying through uh, the sky. We can see the handiwork of God. At night when we lift up our eyes and we can see uh, the moon and the stars, we can see the handiwork of God is right there before us. And all we have to do is just look at one another. We can see the handiwork of God. And we need to understand that this thing didn't just happen. No, no, no. People want to say it was a big bang theory. But I came by to let you know that God spoke. And when God spoke, these things happened. In the beginning, he bent down over the mud and clay and he formed a man and then he blew into man's nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul. You see man happened to become the greatest work of God. Now how would you say that? Well because the Bible says that God made us in his own image and his own likeness. Uh, Genesis the second chapter in the verses number two seven. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And in all the creation, and all the creatures that God had created, the Bible doesn't say that he breathed into them the breath of life, but into this man he breathed into the breath of life. That's why I'm saying to you that man was God's greatest creation, his greatest work. And then... We recognize that sin 
is the greatest curse. Sin is the greatest curse that has come to man. It started over there early in the book of Genesis. You know what happened when God had spoken. God had decreed that there was something that man had to do in order to continue to please him and that he had to do right in God's sight. And you know the story. Uh, God gave the law to Adam and to Eve, and his law was that they should not eat of the forbidden fruit. Uh, Romans 6 and 23, the Bible lets us know, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now you need to understand that the gift of God, eternal life, only comes through Jesus. That's why I come each Sunday night talking about Jesus, keeping in mind that we must lift up Jesus. And his words are, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Are you lifting up Jesus? Did you serve the Lord today? Did you give him any time? If you didn't, you owe God something. Remember, the opportunity is available for you to come out and be a part of our Gospel Truth Worship Hour. Now, let me tell you something. I appreciate you viewing us over your television, but you just need to understand that your television viewing will not substitute you being present and providing service to the Lord. All right? You got to get busy. You have to sing praises to his high and holy name. You have to worship him in spirit and in truth. And you have to fellowship with the saints. You see, you can't do that at home just looking at television. All right? You owe God something. And God has not made it impossible for you to have a place to worship. Right now, the doors are open. The doors were open on the day of Pentecost, about A.D. 33, in the city of Jerusalem. The doors remain open right now. But just keep in mind, one day, one day the doors of the church are going to be closed. It'll be too late for you to get in. Somebody said, well, how do you know that? I'm reminded, remember old Noah? Noah found favor in the sight of God. God commissioned Noah to build an ark. And in the meantime, while Noah was building this ark according to God's specifications, he went about building and he continued to preach. He began to tell people about their evil ways, the sins that they were involved with. They didn't want to hear that. Oh, and Noah kept on building and they just looked at him and laughed. What's wrong with you, old man? Building a boat uh, and there's no water. Well, he was doing what God asked him to do. And then what happened? When God decided it was time, it began to rain. It had never rained before, so they didn't know what to expect. But now all of a sudden it's raining, and it continues to rain, and the rain water start to come up. Then those folk in the city and the community came up and began to knock on the door of the ark. Well, it was too late because God had closed the door. So I want you to understand, you need to get right with God before it's too late because we don't know where death is. It's all around us. We don't know when, where, or how, but we have an appointment. The Bible says, and it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this comes the judgment. I trust tonight that you will recognize Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Now what Jesus did for us, he lived a sinless life. He is our example. He went to the cross so that he could establish his church. Remember, he told his apostles he came into the coast of Caesarea and Philippi. And there, folk were gathering around to look and to see Jesus. And then Jesus asked his apostles, he said, Now, whom do men say that I am? And, and they went on to tell him, Well, you know, Lord, somebody said you're Jeremiah, John the Baptist, Elias, or just one of the prophets. Then he turned to his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And then Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He asked him, But whom do you say that I am? And Peter said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus knew. He had a witness. And he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven, and upon this rock, 
What is the rock? I'm not talking about a stone. It was a hard core statement. The truth, the absolute truth. Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And as a result of that, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's imperative that we study God's word because we know that there are false teachers and false preachers who are in this world today and they're deceiving folk and they're leading men and women away from the Lord. I trust this evening that you'll recognize the need to get right with the Lord and to be a part of his body which is his church because he's the savior of the body. And if you're not in the body, then you can't expect the Lord to save you. I want you to know that the church is the greatest institution that the Lord established. Jesus on the cross of Calvary, he hung there between the twilights of two worlds. Yes, they tell me that the soldiers came and they pierced him in the side. Forthwith there came blood and water. When you listen to the old preacher, the old preacher said the water was for the washing and the blood was for the cleansing. You know what? That's a good point there because those agents are necessary in order for us to get cleaned up. You know, when you wash your clothes, you put some washing powder in there so that they'll be clean. So we need to understand that Jesus' blood was the cleansing power and it washed our sins away. Now we need to know that the Bible is the great guide, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We need to know that all scripture comes to us from uh, the inspiration of God. It's profitable for us that we pay attention and adhere to God's holy and divine word. Jesus died that we might have a right to the everlasting tree of life. And the gospel, the gospel is God's greatest power. Paul said, I'm a debtor, both to the Greek and to the barbarians, for so much as in me is. I'm now ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm encouraging you, if it's God's will, to come out and be a part of the Gospel Truth Worship Hour next week. And if you're not able, I'm encouraging you to join us again next week when the Gospel Truth Worship Hour will again come your way. Remember, by faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, the Lord will add you to his body, which is his church. And then if you live a faithful life, he will save you in the end. The master standing, knocking at the door of your heart. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He says, if you open up and let me come in, I'll come in and sup with you and you with me. What a great invitation the master gives. He says, come to me all your labor and of the heaven laden and I'll give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn me for I'm meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your soul. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lord, I'm not going to put any more on you needn't bear. I'm encouraging you to join us again next week if it's God's will. When the gospel truth will once again come your way, bring it to you spiritual songs and hymns. And until then, it's my prayer that God will continue to bless you and your family and to keep you all safe. Amen.